Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show. This week we are looking at hobbies versus business. How can you dollarize a hobby, particularly if you've got an expensive one? Plenty to take away from this, lots of learning points. See you in the show. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitchell Laurentiu. I can't believe you're here in person, Mr. Baxter. You obviously smuggled yourself over the border. Great to see you. <laughs> Absolutely. Great to spend some face time in the office. It's uh, strange, this virtual world, but I think this is uh, even better sometimes. I've missed you, buddy. I've missed you too. And hopefully you've <laughs> taken up some new hobbies down there. I know that guitar hasn't had much use in your office over the years. <laughs> which is exactly the topic of conversation today. And that is not only uh, undertaking hobbies, but how to actually monetize an expensive hobby, a dream come true. Oh yeah, if you could pull that together, that's the alchemy of, uh, of life really, isn't it? To get paid for what you enjoy doing. And, and, and look, this whole notion, firstly, you know, what's a hobby, what's a business? Because they are quite different. And uh, how can you maybe take one and turn it into the other, which is, uh, yeah, the dream life. And I'm very fortunate to have been part of that, which is, which is great. So Haven't we all? And they yeah. say if you never work a day in your life, as long as you do what you love, right? Which is exactly the, uh, the formula to success. Business versus a hobby. They have to be separate. Do they? And are they different? Mm. Look, I think the, the, the key litmus test, I suppose, is that typically businesses make money. Not always, but businesses should be designed to make money. Hobbies typically cost money. But you can put those two things together and end up with a with a hobby uh, that does become a business for one of a better description. So, you know, as a litmus test, you know, a business is a commercial endeavor that you're involved with uh, to serve people, to fulfill yourself, to make an income, all of the above. A hobby is something that you typically do for passion. But just because you do it for passion doesn't mean to say you can't bring it across the bridge and turn it into an income too. Well, first things first, Amy, the question I've got to, to ask you, we're in the money game and um, typically you and I run a, a pretty tight budget to say the least and we don't spend a lot of money. Is it okay to spend money on an expensive hobby? Because sometimes you know, running a boat or buying new bikes or riding horses, whatever it may be, can, can end up costing you a fair bit. Mm, wait till you have kids, it costs you a lot because, you're paying, <laughs> because then it's their hobby. Uh, but yes, it can be uh, expensive. And you know, we've touched on this in previous podcasts in the past about you know, spending money on yourself. And some people have a guilt trip about that. Others are quite sp- uh, happy to spend money. Um, you know, and you do need things in life that give you some level of color. Uh, and you know, typically, that's what you'd call a hobby. So whether it's you know, having a bit weird this one, but a model train set in the shed, don't have that, uh, or a stamp collection, or maybe your hobby is wine, which is a great hobby to have. Uh, it's one of yours, isn't it? Or sailing or whatever it might be, golf, all of these things give us uh, some headspace to clear uh, and to fully immerse ourselves, if you will, into something that we enjoy doing. And you've got to have that ability to reset yourself personally. If you're a go-getter, if you're a hustler, if you're chasing it hard, you've got to have some downtime, some decompression time to focus on something absolutely uh, that's in a different space. So yeah, hobbies are extremely important uh, and they can become you know, a bigger part of your life, something that you enjoy doing. And if you can parlay some income off it, well, that's a double header. It's fantastic, right? Sure. And before we get into the nitty gritty of that, how much is too much to be spending on a hobby? Because most hobbies, to begin with at least, mostly cost you. Um, is there a, a buffer? Because the value that you get from the enjoyment of that hobby you could argue could far outweigh the cost, or does it? Exotic cars, wine, yeah. Adds up, right? Look, it's a very personal decision as to what you do with your loot and how you spend it. So, I mean, there's no right or wrong, what's too much, what's not enough. Um, you know, and, and, and you can live your life in misery being a miser that just saves and doesn't have any color. So you've got to have something that suits you, but what's right for you is not necessarily right for somebody else. And people have different types of hobbies. Yeah, the, 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 like for example, one of the I've got bees on my farm. Okay, this is a bit weird. So I'm an apiarist. I keep bees. We make honey, and it's probably one of the most enjoyable things that I do on my farm uh, is when we harvest the honey from the hives. It's the most relaxing thing you can do. It's like, assuming you don't get stung, because I've worked out that I've now got an allergy to bee stings. <laughs> I've got an epi pen in my uh, in my in my shed where I do all this. Um, and I find it fascinating because you know, the, the, the mechanics of what goes on in nature itself is, is amazing. And, and, and bees in particular, um, you know, people think, oh, you've got hives for honey. No, you've got the hives to make sure your crops are all pollinated and, and you've got a healthy environment to work in. And the honey is just simply the byproduct of that. It also happens to be something you can sell. So here's a hobby that gives you tremendous pleasure that propagates your land and the trees are all pollinated. And the byproduct of it is you've got a product you can sell. So there's an example of having a hobby that actually could become uh, an income. I don't think it'll be my full-time income. I'd have to have quite a few hives to do that. Um, but it, it, it's something that I enjoy massively. So you know, there's, there's an example of something that literally could be a hobby that is dollarized. Look, look, let's explore that a little bit more. And I think the way we could even split up these two hobbies is in two components. 
One of those being the hobby choosing you. And the example I'll use is, let's say you play AFL as a mm. sport and it's your hobby and you get drafted, that hobby's chosen you, now you make money from it, right? Mm. Versus the other side of the coin, you really like horse riding, but you're not getting paid to do it. Um, how do you then go and make money from a hobby like that? Mm. Okay, so that does become a little bit uh, more challenging because you're pursuing a passion then, uh, as opposed to pursuing the dollar. Uh, and, and one of the comments you made early on is that, you know, as, as long as you do what you enjoy doing, and I always treat what I've done for a living as being my hobby, so I haven't worked for years because I don't, I go to my hobby, it's what I enjoy doing, it just happens to be quite lucrative. Um, if you can shift into that, that's, that's utopia, there's no question about that. But yeah, you are gonna have things that you do that do cost money. Um, yeah, horse riding is a good one. My daughter um, rides horses, and then so there's horses, there's stables, tech room, fencing, feed, vets. That there's an a paraphernalia, uh, the float and the four wheel drive to tow it, uh, and the list can go on in terms of the costs associated with it. But then, where do you want to play within that hobby? If you want to have a pony in the yard that you go hacking around the backyard in or around your farm on? Fantastic. It's not that expensive. Um, but if you want to take it to that next level, rather like anything, yes, it can become more expensive. And you might parlay that into, well, actually, I want to start playing polo. So now I need four horses and a float that drags them around and all the stuff that goes with it and then register with the polo club and insurance. And it, all of a sudden, you're looking at a you know, half million dollar a year hobby. It's very different from just keeping a horse in the paddock. Now, they started off in the same place, passion for riding horses, and they got out of hand. The question is, how can you turn that for example, in the case of uh, playing polo, if that happens to be your thing, uh, into something that can become more beneficial for you financially. And an answer to that, and, and, and I suppose the, the overarching caveat to put on this, there's no tax advice in this. I'd strongly encourage anybody listening to this to get some tax advice from their accountant rather than just plow headlong in, oh, I heard this on a podcast, I'm gonna go and do it. But if your business is quite cash generative, you could sponsor your polo team, for example, and I've seen that happen. It's a great um, idea. It. So now you've got an advertising expense over here uh, that can help cross fund something you're doing over here. Again, go get tax advice on that. Uh, another example of that, um, you know, I've got a buddy, in, he and his wife, their passion is their boat. They've got a pretty nice boat. And they got a private ruling, tax ruling on this, where they have their boat named a particular thing, which is after their business. They do all of their podcasts and all their video stuff with the name in the background and they've written the cost of their boat off as a tax liability. And the ATO didn't like that. That's why they got a, a private ruling on it from a pretty well-known tax barrister before they started this process. But when you think about it, naming rights on something, Telstra Stadium is a football stadium. It's got nothing to do with Telstra's business, but they purchased the naming rights on it, and therefore it's a tax deduction for Telstra. It's advertising spend, and the stadium's got a shingle that's got the Telstra logo outside. Legitimate approach. This is all pretty big stuff though, AB, and that's kind of one end of the spectrum. What about for our more grassroots hobbies? So say you're a, you're a surfer, you're pretty keen, you get out every morning, and you want to take some people for surfing lessons. Is it simply just a matter of, of you know, taking some cash on the side and shoving, your, shoving it in your pocket, or is there a little bit more to it? Well, you can't have it both ways. If you want to run the cost of doing something um, and, and get it as a qualified deduction, well, if there's income that comes from that, you've got to declare that as well. You can't just take the cost and pocket the cash. Um, the ATO don't like that sort of stuff. <laughs> and rightly so. But yeah, if, you, if you're keen on surfing and you start to teach people how to do it and you set yourself up a business to, to, to go do that, so be it. I've got a good friend of mine done that down at Byron. They've got a surf school uh, and that's what they do. So they've parlayed uh, what was a hobby. They were, they were actually in property marketing and they sold that business out, started surfing to chill out, thought this is pretty cool and they started a surf school on the back of it. And, and, and so you can take that into the next level. They still surf, it's their hobby, but it sits within the auspices of their business. You've just got to think laterally around this. One of the things to be careful of, of course, is that the, when it starts to become a business, is that it doesn't blur the lines of your enjoyment of doing something and all of a sudden your motivation for doing it stops being about the fun of surfing and it's all about I can make money if I do this. All of a sudden that's jumped ship if you will, it's across the fence and now it's a bona fide business, it's not your hobby anymore and you might end up losing a hobby that you enjoyed because you pursued it for money. Got you and that, that's a really interesting point. Mm. The, the question I'll ask you AB is, and I know this is a pretty loaded question, but is the goal of life to spend your life working doing what you love in the hobby that you choose or is it about maybe doing your hobby as a side hustle that's the income generator i think you could argue both cases uh in that you know if, if you have if you pursue something you love uh, and it is your hobby and you get paid well for it that's the the perfect trifecta what can i find that i'm good at what do i get paid for what do i enjoy doing if those three things overlap perfect life 
in reality, you know, it's a great marketing slogan, and you often see this in the personal development space, draw your three circles, work out what it is, and pursue it with passion. Not quite as easy as that, you know. My passion is for taking photos of buttercups in meadows. Pretty hard to turn a dollar from that. It's a niche market, Small niche, right? yeah. It's a very small niche. So, yeah, that, that's <laughs> it's also not my passion, but yeah, <laughs> that's uh, it's a great way of spending your time, but hey, we're all different. Um, you know, so yeah, that's something that isn't necessarily the case. Let's say, look, looking in a different way, though, um, let's say you like wine, which I also happen to do. I like and, wine, too. Uh, as we were talking earlier today. And, and, and one of the things, and I've seen this done, um, you set up a, a business that is a wine appreciation or wine review business. You buy your wine, taste it, do a video of you tasting it, providing the tasting notes, post it up on your website and your social media. Maybe you charge people for a subscription, maybe you don't. Maybe you have sponsors if you've got enough followers on there. All of a sudden, you've got a business that's morphed out of your passion for trying wine. Now, probably one of the best known examples of that, uh, many people won't realize this, but Gary Vanacek, uh, uh, and I've spent plenty of time in Gary's company, uh, incredible hustler. That's how he started. His family had a, for want of a better description, bottle shop, liquor store in, in, in the US, and he created the wine show where every week he'd go on and talk about wine, how to pour wine, how to taste it, how to make sure you tasted and smelled it correctly, all these different things. Regularly doing this on YouTube, which built his profile, and all of a sudden you've got someone that's one of the biggest influencers in the social media world, and business world for that matter, that's developed a career purely out of tasting wine on a, on, on, a, on a channel. It's not a bad also, career. Also boosted sales in their bottle shops too. So that stuff can happen. This is not sort of pie in the sky pipe dream stuff. It is very possible to parlay uh, out and into other things on the back of it. Particularly in this world of social media, mm. which you mentioned, AB. So mm. let, let's use that as a subset of our next part of this conversation. Building a business. Um, I'm is just thinking about building my, my wine tasting website so I can sort of get Should we go, we'll and go and have a glass and, after this, shall and we? Provide some qualified advice. Oh, it's not a bad drop there. <laughs> so, social media, very, very powerful tool that you can use to market mm. your business yeah. very, very effectively. Mm. And you can also use it to market your hobby, which can then turn into a business. Mm. In your experience, because we, we spend a fair bit of time, I guess, on marketing and in mm. what we do, how do you then parlay and intertwine all of these factors together? Look, you need a plan like anything. You know, the, 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 you have to have some strategy behind what you're doing. And this is starting to sound quite cynical. Here's my hobby, and now I'm building a business plan out of it to turn it into potentially a business. But you have to have a plan if you want a successful business. That's why most businesses fail. They don't have a plan. They've got no idea what their goal is. They've got no idea of the processes they're trying to build up or what the end game is. You, you know, build it backwards. So, you know, let's say you know, using the world of social media, and if I sort of look at my backyard down at Byron, let's say you're a, a yoga practitioner and nothing does you more fun than getting up in the morning and going to do your, your yoga on the beach as the sun's coming up. And, yeah, beautiful scenario, very nice. And you start to curate that image on Instagram and you've got all your cool positions that you're showing and da 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 and be oh my god, look at the lifestyle you've got. And you go, hey, you know, why don't you follow me in my 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 private group over here? I do guided meditation and yoga sessions every day. I do my practice then and I can walk you through the same thing and you can be like me in my social media curated world. All of a sudden you've got a business. Not that hard, is it? Easy as that. And what's What's happened is you've just taken something you're passionate about and you've dollarized it by having a level of strategy involved. And you do need to have strategy. You do need to have a plan if you want to dollarize anything. It very rarely will happen by accident that someone's going to be walking out, oh, you look pretty good at yoga, can I give you some money? And you, it, it doesn't work that way. Sure. You, have to, um, you have to build a plan out around it, but it's very easy to do. There's a couple of examples. We talked of wine, yoga, surfing, all happen to be um, sort of things that, um, that, that are also quite pleasurable to do. So they're perfect hobbies to parlay into business. Indeed they are. And as my famous, uh, favorite famous philosopher, Alan Watts, once said, um, <laughs> the man. do something, you'll become a master at it if you're good enough and then you can charge a fee for it, which is exactly what we're talking of here. Well, we're in the knowledge world now. Uh, you know, we're in an era where there's a premium on quality knowledge, um, and you know, you see the number of life coaches that are out there that really don't have any knowledge or skills, just a marketing machine. And you see other people that have built up a skill set across something, and, and due to particularly the online world, it's far easier to reach it out. If I look at our business, uh, this all started by accident. I had a client that I met playing golf that wanted to, was investing badly and said, and we chatted away and I told him what I did. And he said, could you teach me? That was the first person that was patient zero uh, for me. Uh, and we sat down and over about five or six weeks taught him how to trade. Played a bit of golf, he beat me every time. Lives up at Sanctuary Cove now and probably would still beat me. Even Did he teach you how to play golf? No, he didn't. He always kept that one up his sleeve. You <laughs> see. Uh, I wasn't going to pay him enough. For, wasn't going to pay up for the knowledge. So yeah, and that, that's how it started for me. And then you know, as time went by, I sat with my accountant and he looked at my tax and said, like, "What do you do to 
people needed to pay tax on that, told him, he said, this is pretty cool, explain me what you do. He said, you should teach my clients how to do this, they need to know it. And so all of a sudden it went from something that was just what I do, and I didn't really, it's kind of interesting, I didn't really think about dollarizing it, it just happened. And you know, we talk about the importance of having a business plan, all of a sudden when you got 20 people coming around your house every day trading, I remember my partner at the time came home and went, who are all these people? Uh, and I said, oh, that's my new project. Said, well, what are you doing? I said, we're trading, that's all. Uh, uh, yeah, and I look at that, that's how I think this whole thing started. I've got you know, tens of thousands of clients all over the world. But it started from that, almost by accident. But clearly we've built a business plan out from there to be able to scale it and provide service levels and dollarize it and all the things that you need to do within a business. And that's why I haven't worked because that's what I love doing. And I, I go back to that client and I'll always, his name was Ray, I'll always be so grateful for that chance opportunity because there's a very good chance I wouldn't have gone down this pathway. I would have been in financial markets, maybe managing money, which is what I've done, but it'd be a lot less fulfilling than seeing those um, light bulbs go off for people as they grasp this and get control of their financial future. And it's funny how things happen, you know, it, you know and, and you know, with plenty of other success stories in, in life where someone's gone from, you know, there's my hobby and now it's my business. Totally, and I've been thankful that you've taught me to do the exact same thing and, and therefore teach other people to do the same thing, which, mm. is, which is great. And as we come to the end of the broadcast, AB, a lot of good sound bites in here. I'm sure mm. our viewers will get a lot out of this one. Any final words here to cap us off? It's tempting to try and be counterculture, I think, at the moment. Or oh, here's, I've got this really expensive hobby. What can I do to get it for free or get a tax write-off on it or, or, or sort of just backdoor what I'm doing? Please don't go down that path. I think that when, you're, when your intention is not pure or right, the outcome you're going to get is never there either. So if you've got something you're thinking, oh, I'm onto a little fast one here, I can screw the ATO and get a bit... Don't, please don't go down that path because it will blow up badly and the penalties for that are hideous. The stress, it just, just don't do that. Get it right first time. Always go about something with the right intention. If you make your decisions for the right reasons, you get a good outcome from it. But when you're trying to do a bit of skullduggery and black arts, oh yeah, I can get a tax write off on this, don't tell anyone, that's going to blow up in your face. And I've, and I've seen that happen also. Um, you know, one of my former neighbours, <laughs> he, he, his, his, um, his uh, passion is, it was, was sports cars at the time, and now he's got a, a GT3. He's in the GT3 Cup. In fact, they sponsor the whole thing now. He's got a big business. And, and that turned into a little hobby that they got some tax deductions on and now they've got naming rights and they run the whole competition. That's a, that's, a, that's a big example. But their pathway into it was through passion and what they enjoyed doing. It wasn't, oh, look, we can get in there and get some write-offs. It was, let's do this because we love doing it. And then it grew into something else. And, and that's the advice I'd say to everybody. Always make sure your intention is right. And if your intention is right, you'll be okay. Go down the dark path, it's going to blow up in your face and rightly so. But find something you love doing. Don't be cynical about it and go, I want to dollarize this, let me find a hobby I can dollarize. Find something you love doing. Enjoy it for what it is. And if that light bulb goes off and you think, you know, there are other people that would enjoy this that I could help along the way and give them a more full life and, and help them shortcut some of the pain of what I've had to go through with my learning, that's maybe something you can dollarize. There's a premium on that ability to fast track and avoid that pain. But if you're cynical about it, oh, how many people are I charged to teach this? That's the wrong mindset. Got you. Great advice, AB. Thank you very much. Mm. Absolute pleasure. Anytime. There you have it, guys. Make sure you give us a review and a rating so we can get the word out, and we'll look forward to hosting you next week. There you have it guys, like, comment and subscribe, but most importantly, hit the notification button and we'll see you next week.